Okay, welcome to a Let's Talk Parkinson's event from Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today we're going to hear about some recent research into the unique needs of women with Parkinson's. My name is Judy Yaris and I serve as Vice President for C PCLA's Board of Directors. For those of you who don't know us, we're a Los Angeles-based nonprofit that provides support, resources, and community for families living with Parkinson's. I'd like to thank our sponsors for the Let's Talk Parkinson series, Abbott, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic. Free programs like this are also made possible by donations from the community. If you appreciate free programs like this one, please consider making a donation on our website at pcla.org. I have a few quick notes for this event. We are recording today's program for our YouTube channel. You will receive a link of the recording. Please stay muted to keep background noise at a minimum. If you have questions, type them into the chat at any time. We will have time for Q&A at the end. Now please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Movement Disorder Specialist Indu Subramanian is a clinical professor of neurology at UCLA and established the Movement Disorder Clinic at the West Los Angeles VA. She is also the director of the Southwest Parkinson's Disease Research, Education, and Clinical Care Center. In addition to her research, which we will hear more about today, Dr. Subramanian has a strong interest in integrative medicine with a special interest in yoga and mindfulness. She is designing a yoga teacher training program for yoga instructors who are interested in working with the PD community. Dr. Subramanian, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure and always uh, excited to share um, about our paper and you know bring women uh, and their needs uh, to the forefront because um, I think it has been a hugely unmet need for quite a while. And, um, thank you for hosting this. And um, yeah, so maybe without further ado, I'll just um, sort of set the stage a little bit with um, the paper and introduce it and some of the highlighted sort of um, gaps. And then we'll also talk about some practical things that women can do. We um, uh, have um, typed those uh, in. I can send those to you as a separate um, sort of resource. Um, and the paper has actually uh, been um, made open access, so that's been exciting as well. And so, um, really, uh, it's it's uh, you know some materials that I think can be um, useful to even engage uh, with conversations for um, women living with Parkinson's uh, to sort of share some of this information with their families and friends and uh, support systems, as well as even their healthcare providers, because um, as we'll see, um, there's a lot of gaps in knowledge as well with uh, in, within the health healthcare space. So, um, so we ended up publishing this paper um, and what really led to this, people have asked me kind of how this all came together. Um, during the pandemic, I was quite worried about a number of our uh, patients living with Parkinson's and how disconnected that they had become. I started running a virtual support group sort of week one of the pandemic and we thought it would be for a few months. Um, and it was with a, a local organization uh, that runs Zoom meetings. And uh, we brought together some various uh, thought leaders, um, neurologists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, we've had over 110 interviews over the last two years, and we also brought in some uh, patient voices as well, and uh, Ben Stetcher was helping me host some of these, uh, who's a young patient uh, uh, with Parkinson's um, living in Canada, and it became this sort of international community that formed um, and really um, a number of, I think, uh, uh, groups uh, went online and really were able to connect with um, ever expanding other um, folks across uh, the world, really. And it's been just a beautiful sort of um, way in, in which we've been able to harness technology to kind of um, work uh, with this sort of, I guess you can call it a silver lining in some ways of this otherwise horrific um, time frame that we've all been uh, living through. Um, and so um, these uh, women would come on and talk about their needs. And it, some of these um, became very evident that they were universal needs. And uh, the women themselves would say, you know, somebody should really write a paper about this and that. So I 
ended up sort of listening to the voices and thinking about how best to frame this paper, approached uh, Professor Moro, um, who's in um, Italy. And I'll, I just uh, threw together a slide with everyone's um, uh, sort of uh, pictures here. Um, so the top three um, uh, co-authors are women who are living with Parkinson's who are in the healthcare field. This is Annelien Wisterbahn, who's a OBGYN in the Netherlands, Sonia Mathur, who is um, a family medicine doctor um, and advocate uh, for Parkinson's living in Canada, Rochelle Flanagan, who's a dietitian in um, the in Ireland. And so these were the three patient voices. Adrian Keener, um, who I know has come on this program to speak, um, is local at UCLA and the VA with me. And then Ellen Amoro, who is um, in Italy, who's been a huge proponent of increasing awareness of women's issues um, in, in Europe. And so we sort of ended up putting together this paper and a framework, um, just looking at um, sort of the gaps and controversies. Um, and normally when you write such a paper, you start off with um, sort of talking about the sort of needs, uh, what we know, and then what we still need to be doing. And really, as we sort of amassed this information, we were really struck by just how much conflicting data there was, how little was really known, and just really sort of how many needs there really were. So that sort of led to um, us trying to educate people a little bit and then come up with some practical tips. And I'll, I'll share with you um, some updates even uh, since we've um, been doing this work. So um, there's about 60,000 Americans that get diagnosed with Parkinson's each year. And there is a, it does seem that there's a lower risk of Parkinson's disease in women versus men. Um, this is about 1.4 times more common in men. But it seems like this is not universally seen across the world in Asia, actually there's a much more sort of um, even um, uh, sort of uh, ratio and in some parts of Asia, even perhaps a little bit increased risk in women. So um, this may have to do with genes, the environment, maybe how we're counting these cases. And so really, when we look at Parkinson's disease, there's um, a lot that we still don't know even about general Parkinson's knowledge. So um, what causes Parkinson's? There seems to be some genetic influences as well as environment. And really most people who have Parkinson's seem to have an interplay between these two factors. And then when we look at women and the risk of getting Parkinson's, it seems like some of the factors that we've historically thought about in men um, seem to be a little bit different in women. And so, um, you know, there's sort of seems to be a little bit of a different um, sense of hormones and how they impact risk. Um, and some of the environmental factors are a little bit different in women um, as well. When we look at a basic science level, estrogen um, is something that seems to be protective in some animal models. And we see that it may have some um, anti-inflammatory properties. It may prevent cell death. It may prevent um, these proteins, uh, alpha-synuclein, from being um, stable and aggregating. So that means these proteins that clump abnormally in Parkinson's may be protected from clumping um, by estrogen. There's also been some research looking at um, estrogen exposure over lifetimes, and it seems like there may be um, a decreased risk um, depending on what part of the life cycle you're in for women, um, as well as um, the timing and duration of hormone exposure may be critical as well. So there's a lot of just um, unclear sense, but it does seem like women get Parkinson's a little less and the estrogen may be helpful. And this may be actually beneficial, not just for women with Parkinson's, but maybe a therapy that we can engage um, in certain models, looking at men and how to help them as well. So the jury's still out as to what this all means, but these are sort of some exciting information when we look at things that are risk factors for um, getting Parkinson's, they seem to be a little bit different in populations of women than in men. And so when we historically have looked at studies, most of our studies look at white affluent, um, older men. And so really we're just realizing that we aren't capturing the full gamut of risk factors and how they influence people because caffeine, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and urate, um, these sorts of things that um, seem to change risk in men do not change risk in the same way in women. So a lot of things still need to be studied here. We also see that women seem to have different types of symptoms than men. And um, women sometimes have more of a tremor dominant type of phenotype. Women also seem to have more non-motor issues in some realms, um, including pain, higher depression scores, um, sometimes higher anxiety scores. So these can all kind of influence how people um, sort of have in, uh, a presentation for their Parkinson's. 
And then also there seems to be another host of non-motor issues that seem to be a little different in women as well. Um, as we mentioned, sometimes tremor, pain, things like that are a little bit more common. GI symptoms, so gastrointestinal symptoms are a little bit, some, some papers report they're higher in women. Um, more recent papers have reported that they're less in women. Um, sexual dysfunction has been reported to be less in women, but some of this may be actually depending on how women are reporting these. And so a lot of our studies really have depended on um, sort of the way that women present and they, they themselves report symptoms to really um, sort of report then how women are doing with Parkinson's. So as we see, because women are not participating in very many studies, we don't have um, a great sense of really what the data is really truly um, showing. So um, women throughout their hormonal cycles also seem to have reports differences in terms of their symptoms, not just in the motor realm, but also in the non-motor realm. So um, there seems to be a change in symptoms um, around the pre-menstrual timeframe. Um, and so one of the questions is whether we can modulate the menstrual cycle with maybe oral contraceptive pills. We don't have a good answer to that. Um, pregnancy and after pregnancy seem to um, have be a time frame when people report worse motor symptoms. And there's not a lot of information worldwide about um, pregnancy and, and safety. We know that um, imantidine is not safe in pregnancy, but outside of that, we don't have a lot of data in terms of safety um, of, for women who are thinking of getting pregnant. And we really have to sort of do better in these realms. And then the Premenopausal timeframe and perimenopausal timeframes are also times when many women report that they may have noticed the symptoms of Parkinson's um, in the first place, or that if their symptoms got worse at this time frame. And so, one of the questions is whether hormone replacement therapy may be useful in these populations. And so, we we ended up sort of making this um, pictorial of the various stages of um, a woman's uh, hormonal life stage, and also um, not just looking at the the sort of hormones and the physical symptoms um, of, of hormones, but also the timeframes in which um, there may be a psychosocial sense of changes um, with transitions in life. And so, you know, earlier on life, um, it can impact relationships, uh, careers, family planning um, to have Parkinson's. Um, then there's the pregnancy timeframe that may be impacted. Uh, the perimenopausal time frame, um, as we mentioned, uh, can be a time frame where there can be mood symptoms also that exacerbate, um, along with um, you know Parkinson's motor symptoms that may be worse. And then the postmenopausal time frames where women are often again transitioning in their social roles, thinking about retirement, grandparenthood, um, different other things, uh, loss of a life partner or other um, friends um, as uh, people age, and so really thinking about these different time frames. Additionally, throughout these stages, thinking about other um, comorbid issues, so bone health, um, cancers that may develop during these timeframes. And so really putting all of this together um, and thinking more holistically, not just about motor symptoms in men, but now expanding it to women, expanding it to these various hormonal life stages, putting in these various sorts of thoughts around psychosocial dynamics and um, sort of uh, uh, support mechanisms and really thinking more holistically about women. So I mentioned that um, certain comorbid um, sort of problems are, are higher in women. And one of those is actually um, bone uh, and hip fractures, for example. And so bone health becomes quite an important thing to be looking at. We don't have a lot of data on how we should be screening women with Parkinson's around this. There are some newer studies, um, for example, the Topaz study that's starting to look at some of this um, in terms of uh, treating um, bone um, density issues. Um, and also in terms of how we give treatments for Parkinson's, it's been pretty much a one-stop kind of standard uh, one, three times a day of Cinemat, sometimes as a starting dose, um, without really catering to um, issues around gender um, or sex. Also thinking about body mass index, um, differences in metabolism. Women do some, seem to have higher tendencies toward dyskinesia, and we're not sure if that's a genetic thing or if it may have to do with their lower body weight. So um, again, a lot of unmet needs um, to still be studied. 
In terms of deep brain surgery, we see that women um, who receive deep brain surgery seem to do very well actually um, with the surgeries um, for the types of symptoms that they're presenting with. But by and large, women are receiving less um, deep brain surgery treatments overall. Um, and this uh, was just um, echoed in a paper that I just, this is hot off the press and I just um, put together this slide this morning, um, looking at um, the ratios. And so you see here that um, this is a, a multi-center study um, by the U Europar, which is this um, uh, sort of group that's in Europe. Um, I think some, some of them are in Germany, some are in the UK um, and Spain. And looking at um, the number of people who got referred for Parkinson's uh, deep brain surgery, so 102 women, 214 men, we see here that um, there was almost an equal number of people who ended up getting um, the surgery, um, but that women seem to, to, despite feeling that they should have the surgery, ended up having um, less surgeries. So this 18.7% versus 9.3% is the number of people who um, uh, sort of um, ended up uh, getting, not getting the surgery because they, they, hold on, let me just make sure I'm not reading this incorrectly. Um, so the number that got surgery is a stark red and the dark blue. So that was pretty equivalent. Um, no DBS, despite positive indication is this, um, this blue, uh, thing. So nine, 9% 9 of men, um, despite thinking that they should have surgery, um, uh, just opted not to get it. And 18.7% of women, so almost double the percentage of women, um, ended up not getting the surgery, despite the fact that they, they thought the, the people who are evaluating them thought that they should. And the reason that they were rejected, um, for this group that was, um, here were a number of things, things like depression, impulse control, hallucinations, need for further medical optimization, neuropsychological impairment and insufficient levodopa dose. And it seemed like there was a higher percentage of women that had depression as a reason that the doctors did not want to do the surgery. But in this percentage of people that um, they themselves, the patients themselves opted not to get surgery, um, despite the fact that the, the treatment team thought it was a good idea. Um, there was a number of reasons uh, that were proposed. Um, there's not a graphic, but a number of the patients actually did not chose not to report why they chose not to have the surgery. And so I think we have to delve deeply into why women are not choosing to have surgery, even though they're good candidates um, and understand, is this something to do with a, a fear um, of having an invasive procedure, um, perhaps um, feeling like an implant within their body may make them less um, of a woman, different types of things that may not be easily reported. So I think we have to do more interviews of these populations. And then the authors, um, I think in, uh, from this data felt that they needed to address counseling of women who were thinking about having deep brain surgery um, with more insight into um, you know, why people don't wanna have these surgeries. And so they, they'd like to explore this more. And so this is literally right out, hot off the press. And I think we're starting to see um, you know, across the, the world sort of um, some impacts of some of the work of at least um, showing that there's gaps um, and, and trying to improve sort of the situation. So why do treatment options differ between men and women with Parkinson's? Well, I don't think we have a sense, and I just showed you the, the, the latest paper. Um, some of it is that patient, it's patient preference themselves. Sometimes there's a risk uh, that's perceived by women that might be higher than what the actual risks are. Sometimes it's a physician bias thing. Maybe there's a, um, other health uh, conditions. As I mentioned, depression um, seems to be one of the reasons that women have not been getting surgery in these, this one cohort that we just looked at. And then there's a lot of um, understudied um, sort of populations for women being included in trials. And so I think we just don't have great ways to give data to women about their true risks. Um, so in order to get treated with Parkinson's, you need to get the right diagnosis. And so one of the problems is also that we really have um, been delaying and missing diagnoses in women. I, I didn't, um, I didn't either, but that was more of like when I was in high school. And I yeah, felt like if, 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 if I ran into someone- You wanna mute them? Okay, perfect. Um, so it's still a clinical diagnosis that requires patients to be um, knowledgeable about their symptoms present to us, um, sometimes go from um, a healthcare provider who may be sometimes a halide health 
care provider like a PA or a nurse practitioner, sometimes it's community-based or a primary care doctor um, to get referred to a neurologist. And then sometimes a neurologist is still uncertain and requires then um, a referral to a movement disorder neurologist. And this seems to be, this trajectory seems to be harder to um, follow in women. And I think that part of it is because a lot of people um, sort of have this brand of Parkinson's in their mind. There's sort of this image of the Parkinson's patient, which is really um, done a disservice. Um, these sort of old drawings of older men that are slouched over, um, that are white, um, have really sort of made people not think about the fact that somebody like me could actually have Parkinson's, a woman, a younger woman, a woman of color. Often this diagnosis is not entertained at all in, in many patients. And if you, the more women we talk to, the more we realize how many years of um, misdiagnosis or um, searching for the right diagnosis has, has transpired. So, um, and even when women are diagnosed, they're less likely to see a neurologist. And this is um, data um, from Dr. Willis in 2011. Um, and people who have uh, the ability to see a neurologist are more likely if you have Parkinson's to get the, the types of treatments like rehab, um, uh, therapies, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. They're less likely to be placed in a skilled nursing facility, less likely to have hip fractures and hospitalizations. And the lower adjusted risk of death is, is less if you have access to a neurologist. So I think that's a huge, um, very important uh, take home message for our women that they need to advocate for themselves, um, become aware of um, the fact that they can get Parkinson's and present to the right types of uh, physicians, advocate to see a neurologist and then possibly even advocate to see a movement disorder specialist. So we see that there's pretty um, significant delays in care. Um, here we have women uh, versus men. Um, it's, uh, they, there's often a delay from symptom onset to seeing a physician in the first place, and then a delay further for women to getting the diagnosis, and then another delay um, to getting to see a movement specialist. And so often these delays are in the order of one to two years um, from symptom onset. But I think in speaking to many of our patients, it's actually even more than that. So also when women are, um, you know, sort of thinking about the trajectory of their disease, women are less likely to visit a physician, even when they get Parkinson's, um, they're more likely to be placed in a skilled nursing facility, more likely to require home health care um, and hospice care. And so um, there, there just seems to be sort of a higher need um, for women uh, to be taken care of in these institutional settings. And some of it is because women are just not getting great care from care providers, and they're more likely to be um, having to pay for um, their own care outside the home. Um, and women are often also much more highly likely to be caregivers themselves. So they're more likely to assume roles as um, parents, um, daughters of aging parents themselves. Um, they are parents of children and grandchildren um, and take on those caregiver roles um, and often neglect their own health problems. And so often there is um, a personal sort of um, reason that some of these delays are occurring as well. And so we really have to let women know that it's important for them to seek the care that they need. And this is just a quote Although I realized that getting this disease is not my fault, it did compromise my roles as a mother of a, a young child, the daughter of an elderly parent, a wife, and a business partner. And so women really do report, um, when we do ask them, higher uh, health-related quality of life issues at diagnosis. They often report um, a psychosocial sort of um, uh, element that is quite significant in terms of receiving the diagnosis and how it affects their perception of themselves, of their womanhood. They feel a loss of femininity, um, and it can really change their spou spousal and caregiving relationships as well. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, women are more likely to pay for non-relatives uh, for their care. They're less likely to be accompanied to office visits, and they're more likely to live alone. And so we really have to find ways to help support our women from diagnosis um, who are living with Parkinson's to engage people in their lives to help prevent this sort of trajectory of being isolated and alone in the long run. So we made this other graphic um, and we've urged women to take a look at it and we've sort of painted a very different face, hopefully of movement of a Parkinson's patient here than that older white man. Um, and uh, really um, we, we sort of spent some time looking at the motor phenotype 
also the importance of thinking about the non-motor phenotype and anxiety and depression, fatigue and apathy and pain are more commonly reported in women. And then really the sort of psychosocial issues. So we have um, women that have a higher psychological distress um, reported, um, some of this sense of loss of femininity, impaired sexual intimacy, feeling of not being heard, they tend to downplay their symptoms, often having a negative or destructive self-image. And so this can really affect um, women um, you know, in the long run. And so I think we have to wait, work hard to help women and support them to prevent some of these issues from creeping in. So another piece that I wanted to highlight is the fact that women have really been underrepresented in um, studies. And so um, it tends to be that um, the histo history of this is that um, honestly, women were barred from participating. Women of childbearing age were barred from participating in research for a very long time. And many of the studies did not require women or ethnic minority or racial minority sort of breakdowns, or, uh, gender sex breakdowns to be reported at all until quite recently. And so really it's been, um, you know, a much more recent sort of um, time frame in which many of these things are required now. And the FDA is actually taking, making this a priority for recruiting specific Specifically, these sorts of populations that have been um, having unmet needs from the past. And so there's been many papers um, sort of citing this recently. And so we just wanted to sort of um, switch over to now just sort of what's what are some practical tips I've laid out um, some, you know, some of the sort of um, the data and the fact that there are all these unmet needs and we don't want to just leave you with a sense of hopelessness from that really want to just spend a few minutes thinking about, you know, what can you actually do. So number one is learn about this, get educated because education is empowerment. So joining um, some of these advocacy groups and you have a great one here, um, learning about Parkinson's disease and um, all of its uh, sort of manifestations, the fact that it's not just a motor disease that affects um, white um, affluent older men. It's really um, something that can affect um, all populations across the world and um, very commonly in women and very commonly in women who are, um, you know, of color as well. So, you know, you can look like me and have Parkinson's. And this is something that I think needs to be retaught in medical schools. And we're trying our best to sort of rebrand the image. Um, learning about it, not just as a motor disease, but also something that affects non-motor issues that can impact quality of life, as well as mental health issues like anxiety, depression, apathy, sleep. These are all very commonly affected, more so in women than men. And then how the hormone cycle, as I mentioned, we talked about the fact that menstrual cycles can affect, and some women report that one in four weeks of the month, if they're menstruating, is really some time that they feel their motor symptoms are worse. The perimenopausal time frames um, are sometimes worse. So these sorts of things, um, and you can go on this blog um, that I've been blogging around parkinsonsecrets.com. Mike Oaken and I have shared a lot of this information. There's also a Spanish um, translated version on that blog as well. And then seeking out the subspecialty care and personalized care that you need. So we mentioned that seeing a neurologist actually um, is a good thing and seeing a movement neurologist is a better thing. So advocating, trying to push your uh, physicians to let you see these folks, check in perhaps at certain key time points. So at diagnosis is probably a good time to make sure that you have the right diagnosis with the movement doc. And then maybe once a year, other time frames that would be helpful um, include uh, one maybe around if you're thinking of getting pregnant, if you're a young woman with Parkinson's, probably better to sort of check in before um, trying to get pregnant to make sure that we take any medicines like amantadine, for example, is not safe in pregnancy, better to get that pre-pregnancy counseling in. Um, also, um, maybe if you're having worsening around menses or um, menstrual uh, perimenopausal sort of time frames, like a reasonable time to check in with your with your excuse me, uh, movement doc um, at those time frames. Advocating for yourself, so doing whatever you can to bring in the pill bottles, write down um, what you need at each appointment um, before you see the doctor, making sure you get the refills that you need written down so you remember to ask for them, keeping all your providers' names handy so the doctors can communicate with those folks, bringing in somebody to visits or having them available at a Zoom visit to write things down, um, take notes, and maybe revisit the after-visit summary paper with, work with the person that comes in with you, make sure you understand what the plan of care is before you leave your provider's office, because often many of us are, you know, seeing many patients for six, 
once in six months for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and sometimes things get missed. And so you want to make sure you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Um, find a provider that you feel you can speak to that understands you, that you feel heard and seen by that provider. That relationship is important. If you're not getting that sort of care, you know, um, perhaps, you know, talk about finding somebody else or um, having an, a different advocate come in with you and see if, uh, you know, they may be able to help with that relationship. Um, expanding sort of other providers in your circle. So, so it doesn't always have to be only the neurologist is your only sort of cheerleader um, or a uh, point of uh, information. Um, seeing people like uh, physical therapists, psychologists, um, even engaging people like yoga teachers or personal trainers to help cheerlead for you, um, dietitians. There's a huge multidisciplinary team engaging sometimes social workers, spiritual leaders, you know, think about health in a more holistic way and who may be able to sort of um, rally for that for you. Um, Finding your tribe, a huge amount of my research in the last couple of years has been around social connection and the importance of loneliness and how bad it is for all of us, honestly, on this planet. So thinking about, again, that advocate, who's going to be that cheerleader for you? And it may not be your spouse. Um, a lot of the times, you know, when we see women living with Parkinson's, we realize that, you know, their husband may not be the, the best person to advocate or to be their sole caregiver and provider. It might be, um, you know, engaging a friend or a sister, a daughter, a daughter-in-law, somebody, um, you know, who you can feel uh, open with dialoguing with about your symptoms and can advocate for you. And it's really important not just to have one person. It really should be sort of a tribe of people that really bring you joy, a group of friends that you may be able to connect with either together in a group or um, individually, um, and really sort of, you know, being part of this human experience of laughing, playing, relaxing, sharing your stories can really be very therapeutic. And I think we've really, unfortunately, as a society, strayed away from that. So again, trying to reconnect with that. Um, joining a support group like this one can be very helpful in finding local support. And there are women specific support groups as well that can be helpful and even women language specific. So there's um, Compe de Parkinson's is a group in uh, Spain that's for women um, who are Spanish speaking. And then the last um, point is that we're really thinking about advocacy and trying to get um, involved in whatever way you can can be very meaningful. Um, so getting involved with research, getting involved with the advocacy organizations, there's one called the PD Avengers, for example, that is um, new uh, in the last couple of years since the pandemic, who are really advocating for changing things like pesticides and, um, you know, getting together and making differences for pushing certain things into law. So again, you know, taking the energy from maybe a negative diagnosis um, that you may view as something that is really um, something that you're fighting against and using that energy and putting a positive spin on it um, to sort of connect with other people and help each other um, can actually be tremendously therapeutic, actually. So, so I think with that, I think that's our last uh, slide here. I'm happy to um, stop sharing and maybe open it up. I haven't really been keeping great track of the time, but um, it looks like we were about 35 minutes in, so we probably have about 20 minutes for questions. Happy to also give you a couple updates on kind of where um, where we are. So, am I? Did I stop sharing now? Nope. Yes, you stopped sharing. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, so much information <laughs> and so important. Um, could you talk? I, I know we we didn't touch on this in you gave a lot of facts, but I know that it's important to you to talk about mindfulness, yoga, and PD and how you approach that. Can you give a little bit of reference to that before we yeah. get to some other questions? Sure. Um, so you mean for women or for, well, for women, for okay. women, I mean, obviously in general, but I think for women specifically, there may be some things. Right. So, um, so first of all, you know, this mindfulness and yoga. So, so backing up, I'm, I've, I've been very interested in this in my personal life. I have a yoga teacher training and I did a lot of, um, training in mindfulness at the VA, which has actually been quite open-minded to a lot of these sort of what we call historically complementary and alternative medicine approaches, but now has been termed integrative medicine. So we're integrating Western medical approaches with some of these other approaches. And, um, so the, these sort of 
treatments. Um, so, so integrative medicine is basically, you know, the sort of borderland and it's now a fellowship. You can actually train in it um, and take an exam in it. And so I've been quite interested in out of the box approaches just in general for, um, you know, what patients can do every day to help themselves exercise is one, you know, a diet and, um, you know, social connection is something that I've been stressing, but the mind body approaches is sort of one category that I think falls in this um, uh, sort of prescription of what people can do. And um, just in general, we're finding in aging um, and in current society that a lot of the times we're spending so much time on devices and multitasking and running around doing a lot of things that we've really sort of strayed away from just sort of time where we can kind of pay focused attention sort of into the body, into the mind, sort of with our own sort of thoughts. And, um, you know, historically, I think many of many practices, many religious practices, many um, sort of groups in, in society, you know, would spend some time, you know, in church or praying together or, you know, coming together and in, in these different activities where you would unplug and have, you know, sort of a network of people that you would come into a space and sometimes connect um, sort of in these sort of um, avenues. And there's many Eastern traditions, um, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, have some of these sorts of approaches as part of the lifestyle that many people have. So um, you might have a uh, chant that you say over and over that may be a focus of your attention and you, or meditate. Yoga is something that is somewhat of a moving meditation where you have poses, but you're also working on breath and marrying breath and poses. And then there's also this sort of meditation, meditative aspect of um, yoga in and of itself, where you're bringing the mind and sort of focus and sing it sometimes in, in different regions of the body. And so um, what research has been showing is that these sort of mind body approaches can actually be very, very beneficial for a number of um, things. One is cognitive decline. So there seems to be some research that, you know, not multitasking, not sort of focusing on 50,000 different things, not being completely captivated by our devices all day is, um, is actually beneficial. So if we can kind of um, take time, maybe 20 minutes, uh, you know, once a day to kind of um, do one of these mind-body approaches, maybe meditate. Um, if 20 minutes seems like a crazy amount of time, starting with even a minute or two and, and sort of using um, a focus, um, sometimes it's a body scan, you might sort of place uh, sort of attention with your eyes closed on, you know, sort of, um, you know, bring attention to your feet, um, to your hands, to, you know, different parts, maybe attention to the breath, feeling the breath going in and out of your body, these sorts of things. Sometimes it can include guided imagery, sometimes it include all kinds of different sort of focuses, sometimes, um, you know, even um, you know, sort of a, a chant or a mantra that you might focus on. So, so these sorts of approaches, I think, can be very therapeutic. In Parkinson's, we have some early data looking at cognition. There's some imaging data that looks at centers of the brain um, that are affecting um, sometimes, uh, you know, different sorts of cognitive pathways and other things. And there does seem to be some early evidence that these things are beneficial for Parkinson's patients. And I think my sense is what really is benefited is really in the non-motor realm. So things like anxiety, depression, we have data in other disease states that these are better. Um, and in Parkinson's patients, I think these sorts of non-motor issues can be improved with mind-body approaches. Sleep can be improved. I think um, cognitive decline, we have some early data to looking at that, um, but we don't have you know robust, robust data. So, um, so I think there's a number of groups studying this. And I do think that if you can incorporate some aspect of these mind-body approaches, um, and as women, we tend to, as I mentioned, become very um, enthralled and uh, caught up in taking care of everybody else and not take finding the time to do these strategies. And I think it becomes like the last thing to do and so often doesn't get done. So if you can find a way to put, you know, 20, 30 minutes of exercise, getting cardio, stuff like that on the calendar, maybe getting um, a date with a friend on the phone, even for five minutes or 10 minutes a day, maybe spending 10 minutes in a mind body sort of approach. And if, if meditation is not appealing to you, there are other ways to some somehow harness this. So one would be journaling, for example, just taking time and writing gratitude, things you're grateful for different prompts are available, um, spending time in nature. So going for a hike, 
getting out um, in nature, gardening sometimes, or, you know, just um, feeling their meditations around, you know, a walking meditation with the grass and feeling the grass, the air, you know, these five senses, you know, different, different types of things in nature. Um, prayer is actually something that I think definitely taps into this. And so I think it's important to think about what you might already have in your life that you love. And if you love that, maybe do more of it. So maybe it's, you know, listening to, um, you know, some prayers and praying along or chanting along, um, choir at church, you know, with some other folks, you know, if you can kind of sometimes kill a few birds with one stone. So if it's a social thing with, um, the mind body stuff, it's actually very beneficial. So, so I think, you know, there's sort of, I think there's definitely some early evidence. I think we want to make it accessible to people. Um, so think about what kinds of things you may be already doing and see if you can incorporate more of it, but it is important to try to get it in as best as you can every day. Thank you so much that, that we have time for more questions. Um, if you find that it's difficult for you to put it into the chat, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. So let's see if we have anyone that would like to do that. I see. Let's see here. We had a comment that someone loves nature therapy and I know we've been hearing a lot about that, hugging a tree. <laughs> it's there's something yeah, i mean i think there's actually so there's some evidence in general in integrative medicine that um plants and trees release certain chemicals that we as humans actually feel better with um it's almost like a a natural sort of um chemical uh that we can breathe in um that that is seen in forest bathing and stuff and there's actually certain practices and other sort of um societies where people spend time in groups in nature. Um, and if you think about even the things that we like historically as tribal communities did, a lot of the things we would do is probably sit by a fire. Sometimes, you know, there'd be a drum circle or chanting or telling stories, um, you know, uh, with each other around a fire in the night sky, looking up at the stars, um, being, you know, in nature, maybe water, um, you know, women coming together, washing clothes in the river, lake. Um, so, you know, I think uh, there, there are, you know, many communal things that we've historically done as people on this planet that we've sort of strayed so far away from that um, get, getting some of this back is actually probably a good thing. That's great. Um, we do have a, a question here now from Janet. Uh, could you comment on a DAT scan to confirm a diagnosis? Uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> we've been giving a bunch of these talks, um, Dr. Keener and I uh, all over, and uh, we just had that talk, we just had that question this morning on a different talk. Um, so a DAT scan is basically a, um, a functional imaging study. So it is, um, looking at not the anatomy, but it's actually looking at what the cells are doing and how they're sort of up, taking up um, these tracer that we put into the body. So when we think about an MRI or a CAT scan, um, these are more like a map. So we're looking at the geography, like is everything in the right place? Is there anything, you know, that we see that's in the wrong place or, you know, um, like a tumor or something else that's in there um, or a stroke or something. So that's what an MRI and a CAT scan do is look at the sort of anatomy of the structures. But what the DAT scan does is it's a functional imaging study. So it's actually looking at um, when we inject a tracer into the blood, where that tracer goes and how it's taken up by the cells. And it compares sort of the take the uptake of the chemical in one body, uh, one part of the brain versus another. So it's looking at the function of the cells and in a DAT scan, it's looking at what we call um, the dopamine uh, sort of um, the uh, the, the, the uptake of, of, uh, dopamine transporter. So, um, it's, it's really, um, a functional imaging study and it's not an absolute hundred percent yes or no. It's very subjective and, um, it becomes sort of important to know that you're getting it at a good center, as well as um, the person who's reading it knows what they're doing. And honestly, we don't really order these tests very often. Um, we often joke about like remembering when the last time we ordered one was because it's really still a 
clinical diagnosis. Parkinson's is a di diagnosis that it, the accuracy of it improves if you can see a neurologist and even more so if you can see a movement disorder neurologist, there's sort of a higher tendency for the person who sees this all the time to pick it up accurately and to diagnose this accurately. And it's really looking at what right now, a constellation of motor symptoms. So stiffness, slowness, sometimes tremor, um, not everybody has to have tremor, getting a sense of the uh, history, the timeline, the exam, um, putting people through sort of certain types of movements in the office. And so often an in-person exam is much better than um, a video visit because we are looking for stiffness, which we really have to touch you and look, look at your, pull you back and look at your walking and stuff. So it's a much better sort of um, accuracy if you're in-person. And then we sometimes will even say, well, we think you have Parkinson's, we're going to treat you, put you on a medicine and then see how you do with the, the medicine um, over time. And uh, really the response to treatment is also very helpful. So that's really the clinical diagnosis that we do. DAT scans are really, in my opinion, reserved for a niche population of people. It's best um, really ordered by a neurologist for good reasons. And you have to have a sense of why you're ordering it. It's not going to be a hundred percent yes or no. Um, and it's very interpreter dependent. So the reasons that sometimes we'll order a DAT scan will be um, sometimes if we're thinking about doing deep brain surgery, sometimes we'll order it if it's something that's a bit quirky with the exam, or sometimes if somebody's on certain medicines uh, that are for psychiatric issues that can confuse us to thinking people have Parkinson's. So it's, it's a rare occasion. Um, really, we're, we're ordering these very infrequently and it's not something that's absolutely part and parcel of, in my opinion, the um, workup or, or you know, diagnostic um, sort of trajectory of normal, usual sort of standard of care Parkinson's patients. Thank you. We have another question from Lee. How do you know when you need carbidopa levodopa when you are early on in PD? I am taking it, but I'm not sure I need it. Which symptoms should be considered in this in this more than others? Yeah, so, um, so that's a good question. So historically, we used to be very shy about giving um, carbidopa levodopa, there was a sense that, you know, maybe it was toxic to the brain or a, like a brain poison or something like that. That was sort of, I think, you know, the old school notion. And I think that's been dispelled. That myth of levodopa phobia has really been dispelled. So I think that the things that we think um, why you would need it are um, if you have disability um, and you're not able to do lifestyle choices, um, like exercise to the best of your ability and stay active and connect and do things um, in your day to day life, your activities of daily living, and your motor symptoms are getting in the way of you thriving in those aspects, then we should think about starting carbidopa levodopa. And, you know, historically, we used to try to spare that drug in younger people with Parkinson's, and we'd substitute other medicines and really keep it in the back pocket for later. But I think the pendulum has swung towards, you know, giving it there's a sense that if you can keep people moving well, exercising well, connecting well, um, staying in, in at work or staying in, you know, society and connecting, um, you know, at the best of their ability, that that, um, you know, leads to better function and, and an outcome overall. So that's what I would say is, you know, if you're having, um, like, let's say cramping or stiffness, slowness, that is leading you not to be able to exercise much, or, you know, you really, you're like when you get on the treadmill and you start walking, you start cramping, that would be a reason to go on it. Or if you're having things that are affecting your ability to do your daily life activities, sometimes tremor is a symptom that we may not treat because sometimes the medicines, um, you know, are not terribly effective for tremor and it's more of a social kind of nuisance or embarrassment. That's a symptom that we often, you know, is a bit more controversial whether to try a medicine or not. So, um, but again, I think you want to get a good opinion, talk to your doctors about what you can and cannot do. And, um, you know, I think the fear of going on it, if you need it, um, you know, we have a lot of good data now to say that, you know, many people do much better if we start early with treatment um, and not spare it for, you know, a rainy day down the road. Okay, we have another. This is probably related to this. Nancy is asking, is there a baseline for carbidopa levodopa upon diagnosis? Like a starting dose? Yeah, so usually um, how I like to start it is we use a 25 100. So that's the 25 is the amount of carbidopa and the 100 is the amount of levodopa. And the 25 number is the chemical that carbidopa prevents the peripheral breakdown 
of levodopa into dopamine in the in the blood and the body. So it lets um, you know sort of this uh, this this then the levodopa not be broken down into dopamine in the blood and the body. The the levodopa goes into the brain and that get, gets converted there into dopamine, so we can use it in the brain. Um, and so that's usually the, the ratio one to four. So 25 to 100, that's the yellow, um, cinemat tablets, for example, in, in the U S and we, I like to start it at like a half a tablet three times a day, and then go up to about one tablet three times a day. That would be a reasonable starting dose. And we usually try to give it away from protein because protein can affect the absorption of the medicine. And we usually try to give it, um, an hour before meals if we can, because, um, you know, we want to kind of cluster it when you're awake in the day and not be giving it like every eight hours, the last dose is at bedtime or something. We want to kind of start that's, that's probably a reasonable starting dose, but that's, um, you know, everyone can be a little different. So if your neurologist is saying something different, listen to them, but that's how I do it. Okay. Thank you. Is there a specific style? Oh, this is from Mimi. Is there a specific style of yoga? A, a Yengar, Vinyasa, a quiet versus active, which is more beneficial to PD patients? Right. I don't think we have great data on that. And I think that, um, you know, if you love yoga and you love a particular style and you're going to stick to it, then just do whatever, you know, floats your boat. And if you like to mix it up and do that, I think there's benefits to both. Um, Iyengar has a lot of, you know, sometimes a little bit slower, but has, you know, you get more deep into some of the mind body spaces because you're not necessarily moving as much and uh, maybe sometimes focus a little bit more on breath. Um, and I think you can use modifications and, and sometimes get into really great, you know, sort of postures with relaxation and long stretches with that. Vinyasa has got a little bit more flow. You might get a little bit more cardio with that. And that's also beneficial because um, getting your heart rate up with Parkinson's can be um, beneficial as well. So again, I think, you know, if there's one that you love, then do that. Um, you know, and, and if you hate yoga, it does not for everyone, then, you know, maybe try something different. So it's really about figuring out what you're going to stick to, because if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. Right. We have another one from Gabriella. Have there been findings on how much stress speeds up the advance of PD? This is a great question. <laughs> yeah. So stress, I mean, we don't have great data on much of this. And sometimes, you know, stress is interesting because some small stressors are important actually to keep um, certain organisms functioning. So, so mild stress, um, you know, is something that we all need and sometimes thrive on a little bit, but when it becomes chronic and sort of debilitating and sometimes trauma that sort of is huge that hasn't been dealt with or things like the pandemic where you're sort of just dealing day in and day out with, you know, these stressors maybe of isolation and um, other things, it can be quite wearing on the body. And what we see is that stress, um, the cascade that we sort of invoked in our loneliness paper was that people, um, you know, who were lonely ended up getting more stress uh, response chemicals like cortisol was released and then can affect um, certain sorts of um, cells to function not so well, um, leading to more. Um, and sometimes, you know, cortisol can affect um, even uh, things like diabetes risk and other sorts of things affect sleep patterns um, and then affects um, sort of uh, motor, motor and non-motor issues in a negative way. And then there's a sort of feed forward cycle of feeling worse and then not not doing exercises and, and getting more socially connected and this sort of this downward pattern. So I think that stress is something that we all have. It's part of, I think the human condition, but how to deal with that is really, you know, what we're trying to help people to do better. And I think the sort of um, proactive lifestyle choices of exercise, eating right, sleep, all the things that we need to kind of put ourselves in the best framework to do well, you know, is, is important. And then also, I think sometimes the sort of sense of sometimes working with a psychologist or other folks that may be able to sort of help, you know, these non-motor issues around depression, anxiety are very real and often can be treated sometimes with, you know, modulating serotonin or other sorts of chemicals. Um, and they're very common um, Parkinson's disease. But, um, you know, sometimes people get stressed about things they have actually zero control over. And a lot of what I end up talking to my patients about is just sort of letting go of the things they have no control over and then focusing on the things that they do have control over because, you know, there doesn't help anyone. I have patients who stress out about their grandchildren who live in a different state. <laughs> where I'm like, 
you know, <laughs> you have no control over that or, you know, right. what's happening in the Ukraine. Like, I mean, I, I like, we don't personally, yes, we can, you know, but like, you know, losing sleep over that and then feeling worse from your Parkinson's is probably not going to affect, you know, your, your specific situation right now. So I think again, um, it's helpful to, uh, you know, learn about things maybe in a con controlled framework, but then finding ways to manage stress and then, you know, sort of choosing choices that make sense. And you take control over the things that you can like these sort of, you know, when you're going to exercise, when you take your pills, how much sleep you get and being kind to yourself and the people around you. Those are sorts of the things that I think we have more control over than these greater life stressors. So. Thank you again, Dr. Subramanian. This has been an amazing presentation and um, I want to dive deeper into the paper. I, I sort of went through part of it, but now I really want to get deep into it. Uh, do we have any last question, burning desire question someone would like to unmute? If not, we are going to thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been a great event. And we have some great events coming up as well. On Saturday, May 7th, we're presenting a half-day education conference for the Spanish-speaking Parkinson's community, which is very exciting. And on May 12th, we're going to learn about Parkinson's changes as it advances and about how Duopa therapy may be beneficial. On May 26th, our board member and speech language pathologist Julia Nichols will give us an overview on the options for speech therapy for Parkinson's. Information about these and our other upcoming events will be emailed to you. The, our sponsors today, we want to thank them for Abbott, Abby, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and of course, by you. By donating to PCLA, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of the families in our community who are living with Parkinson's. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider donating at PCLA.org to help us continue our work and continue to provide programs like this for free. As always, reach out to us with questions at info at PCLA.org or by phone at 310-880-3143. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Subramanian, thank you again. This was really wonderful. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.